themes for decades. Um, you um, have tackled issues of discrimination, protection of human rights defenders, and emerging issues related to businesses' impact on human rights. And your byline has appeared in leading international newspapers, and you're currently a contributing editor to the Caravan and Mint. So, Salil, um, I think you have a task today to frame up for us how business and human rights stories have really been something that they're not new, they've been around for decades. And through that arc of history, we can really understand how these stories are critical for all of us who are media professionals, who are campaigners, um, who are uh, communicators. So Salil, I wanna hand it over to, the, to you and please take it away, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, and uh, uh, for the very kind introduction and setting the scene so well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I want to take us back to one night in December, 1984, in a central Indian city called Gopal, where a cloud of gas leaked out of a fertilizer plant swirling over the city. The gas was known as methyl isocyanate. It was poisonous and very little was known about its toxicity. It spread far and wide. The silent killer suffocated thousands of people that night in a city where people live side by side with industrial complexes. The plant was owned by an American company called Union Carbide, which manufactured the fertilizer for domestic consumption. When the accident occurred, much of India was in the middle of a parliamentary election. Up to 3000 people died immediately and close to 10,000 people and possibly many more had their lifespan shortened, dying much earlier than their regular lifespan. Victims of the disaster continue to seek justice. American lawyers sought to represent Indian clients, but India argued before an American court that it had the capacity to try the corporation at home. And so the US court sent the case back to India. A deal was later struck between the government and the company in 1987 and Union Carbide paid a substantial sum, but admitted no wrongdoing. And survivors and victims' families have continued to suffer poor health and are still fighting for justice. Later, Union Carbide sold its global business interest to another American corporation known as Dow Chemicals. But the Indian subsidiary was hived off, sold to another Indian company. Victims have sought justice for years, as I mentioned, and Dow Chemicals, as a parent corporation of Union Carbide, Carbide, insists that it has no responsibility for what had happened in Bhopal that night when it was nowhere on the scene. And that is correct. Dow Chemicals did not own Union Carbide in 1984. But the gas leak was not a freak occurrence. The role of the company had been under the scrutiny of an intrepid journalist for quite some time. His name was Rajkumar Keswani. Keswani, who died at the age of 71 in May this year, had been persistently reporting on the failings at the Bhopal gas plant. He pointed out the shortcuts that the inspectors were making, the risks that the plant posed in an area which was highly populated and congested, and in the administrative and managerial shortcomings. Few took notice of his stories early, and yet his diligent reporting deserves far greater attention than he received. Journalists engaged in reporting the human drama need to follow his footsteps. In the next few minutes, I shall try, try to identify what those steps are and why this guidance by the UNDP's Asia Pacific Business and Human Rights Hub matters and why it is so vital to enhance our understanding of what makes the world work and how journalists can tell stories to make those who wield power more accountable. The Bhopal gas disaster is unique for the number of deaths, but sadly it is part of a pattern if you dig further, you will discover in 1956 a scandal in a Japanese town called Minamata, where the release of mercury sulfate in the wastewater at a chemical factory owned by Chiso Corporation contaminated the city's supply, creating a neural disorder that affected thousands of people. The plant continued to operate between 1932 and 1968, and thousands of lives were affected. Let me turn to yet another disaster. This year, 2021, is an important date for one of the fastest growing economies in South Asia, Bangladesh, as it celebrates the 50th anniversary of its independence from Pakistan. When Bangladesh emerged as a new nation, a State Department official in the US described it as an international basket case. The international community assumed that Bangladesh would remain the poster child of poverty. Its budget would be made up of grants from weary, 
angst-ridden Western governments. But today, Bangladesh has superior social and human development indicator than many countries in its neighborhood. It's house, it houses its poor people better, educates its girls, offers superior healthcare, and children born to Bangladeshi mothers have better chances of a longer life expectancy than most of its neighbors. Bangladesh's success rests on several factors. One is its overseas workers and who send billions of dollars in remittances and its productive garment workers. Many of them are women who stitch the clothes that much of the Western world wears today. This garment export saga is a glittering success story. However, in 2013, a building called Rana Plaza collapsed in Dhaka, Bangladesh's capital, and more than 1,100 workers died. Many survived, but they have physical disabilities. The factory inspection had been inadequate. The building had added facilities and floors without getting proper authorization. The factories were working overtime to meet production targets for multinational brands. They competed with one another on cost because the global garment industry sought fast fashion where clothes are made cheaply in countries with low labor costs and supplied efficiently to the world's malls. That well-oiled, outwardly efficient supply chain has lifted millions of workers out of absolute poverty, but their existence remains precarious. As the COVID-19 pandemic has shown, when the factories close, the workers are pushed back into poverty as there is relatively ineffective safety net. The collapse of Rana Plaza led to the creation of two multi-stakeholder initiatives to address the problem, Accord and Alliance, which were effective insofar as they aimed to prevent a repeat of such a colossal collapse. Rana Plaza was not the first disaster to strike Bangladesh. Bangladeshi and international reporters, trade union leaders, and human rights defenders have been crying hoarse for years about the conditions in which the factories operated. Over 100 workers had died in a fire at a factory in 2012. It must be our hope that such disasters don't happen again. Our understanding of the interplay between business, politics, and society is enhanced when we connect these dots. Regulatory failure leads to disasters, and disasters have adverse impacts on human rights. Eternal vigilance is the cost of liberty, and the three actors, independent actors, who cast light in these dark alleys and hidden corners of global commerce matter. What is to be done with it is up to us. Those three actors are union leaders, human rights defenders, and journalists. Union leaders champion rights at work, human rights defenders campaign to improve human rights for all, and journalists listen and observe and tell stories that someone somewhere wants to suppress. That is news. The rest is advertising. News may be the stuff between the ads, but without news, a newspaper is worthless. Asian countries have focused on improving competitiveness by lowering barriers, and since the early 1990s, there has been an upsurge in foreign investment in manufacturing, transforming ag agrarian economies. Unions, civil society groups, and journalists are essential to ensure that the development is fair and just. Many reporters, local and foreign, have been highlighting stories involving the interplay of business, politics, and society, and what it does to the people. In the Philippines, Maria Ressa has been fighting a valiant battle. In Indonesia, investigative reports by journalists and human rights groups have shown poor working conditions in plantations. Wire agency reporters have exposed the role of unscrupulous below the radar businesses engaged in human trafficking in the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. Journalists have examined what has come to be known as khaki commerce in many parts of Asia, where the military owned businesses skew development priorities. Australian journalists have closely scrutinized a controversial coal deal of an Indian company in their country. And journalists have shown the role of timber and gem trading companies in Southeast Asia in perpetuating human rights abuses. As we travel across Asia, from the football factories in pa Punjab in Pakistan, to the shipbreaking facilities at Alang in Gujarat, India, from the brick-making factories in Bangladesh to the rubber glove-making factories in Malaysia, canned seafood manufacturers in Thailand or construction projects in Singapore, cotton producing farms in Xinjiang, China, and the export processing zones in Sri Lanka, we find stories crying out for attention. We find human drama that adds a new dimension to our understanding of economics and dry statistics of growth, gross domestic product growth. They also point out the failure of governments to protect human rights, the weaknesses of international standards and human rights mechanisms to safeguard the rights, and the role businesses played in maintaining the status quo. 
This does not mean that everything wrong with the world or every abuse affecting the poor, the dispossessed, the marginalized, and those who are denied their power is because of business. Far from it. The role of the state, the unwilling one and the unable one, is important. But this does mean that there is much more that business can do to improve people's lives beyond what companies claim in their glossy brochure and when they sign up to adhere to the aspirations of the Sustainable Development Goals. This responsibility is twin. The state has the obligation to protect rights, business has the responsibility to respect rights. And yet we find that there is a gap between the rhetoric and the reality, and this is where it becomes necessary to identify remedies. In fact, what I've just described, protect, respect, remedy, is not a magic formula. It reiterates what the world needs, and it has been established succinctly in the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. This is an appropriate moment to remember the pivotal role of John Ruggie, former special representative of the UN Secretary General for Business and Human Rights. He played role, the role in drafting those principles and steering them skillfully through the labyrinthine corridors of power. Professor Raghi, who was a friend and a mentor who died last week, was an astute political scientist who understood how the world worked. He knew why it was important to bring along all stakeholders together to build an architecture where companies would respect rights as long as the state kept its part of the bargain of protecting rights. And since Raghi knew our world and its imperfections, he called for remedies that identify, prevent, and mitigate harm. This framework is crystal clear and commonsensical. His legacy will continue to inspire us. The stories of business impacts on human rights matter, not only at the rarefied gabfests of Davos or Geneva, they affect lives on the ground. One of the features of business journalism is the emphasis on growth and profit and stressing the positive. Clever public relations companies work assiduously to cultivate journalists to cast their clients in a positive light. Men and women in expensive business suits speak in achingly dull cliches about playing a meaningful role to make the world a better place and toss in terms like sustainability, inclusiveness, and being good corporate citizens. Companies can, of course, be the force for good. They are force for good. They are, of course, important. They create jobs, pay taxes, produce goods and services, and provide services efficiently, and do make the world a better place through imaginative interventions, innovations, and inventions. But an aircraft taking off and landing smoothly doesn't make a good story. A delayed flight, a scheduling mix-up, baggage being mishandled, or tragic crashes, they, made, they make news. It is when things don't work as advertised or intended that a reporter gets interested. And there is a business angle to virtually every story that's outwardly political or social. Reporting about business should not be mere reiteration of balance sheets, price earning ratios, corporate plans, size of an initial public offering, or the insatiable search for unicorns. Good reporting requires that you look beneath the surface. Yes, a company hiring more women in managerial positions, that is good. But when it, when it has to downsize, are women employees on the shop floor more likely to lose jobs? That is a more real story. When a company allows its workers to work from home, are women more likely to face stress, mental pressure, violence at home? Are they more likely to drop out? It is those stories that a good journalist seeks. The role of a business journalist then is not to be a cheerleader for the corporate world, but to ask questions about the impact of business on the society. To be sure, it does not mean being critical of business, but skepticism is a cornerstone. So what should reporters do? In my last few minutes, let me point out some of the, some of the things reporters do need to do. Listen to all the sides, not only corporate executives and their agents, but also the workers and members of the society. Protect your sources. There are good reasons why employees or representatives of communities impacted by a company's actions may prefer anonymity. Protect them, ensure that they are not harmed. Trust, but verify. Every assertion is a claim. Ask when a company claims it has done something. Ask the activist for evidence, not his or her opinion, when the activist blames a company for what could be a systemic or governmental failure. Understand the complexity. Business stories are not only about one company gaining market share at the expense of other. It's not a sports match, but the complexity of why companies have behaved the way they have done. One side doesn't fit all. After the coup in Myanmar, some companies may have good reason to stay on. 
if their withdrawal would lead to hundreds of thousands of women losing their jobs in the garment sector. At the same time, some companies may be justified in leaving if their continued presence leads to becoming complicit in abuses. A good reporter will analyze those complexities. Figure out where the responsibility lies. The state has an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. Its unwillingness and inability to play that role does not mean a corporation has to substitute the state. A company has neither the mandate, nor the capacity, nor the authority, and often no expertise to replace the state. There is a good reason why today, East India Company is only a boutique brand and not a colonial power. Draw on the framework. Based on the UNGP's journalists should identify what is expected of the state and the company, and raise questions about assumptions, challenge assertions, and go as far as the facts take them. And let the reader or the viewer decide. A journalist is not a propagandist. She is not an activist. He is not the sole arbiter of truth. Journalists should provide accurate information and interpretation to the readers and viewers so that they can conclude what the truth is and act accordingly. This guidance is important. It clarifies why business and society are interlinked. It shows how a society's progress is to be measured, not only by the dollars and cents earned by the shareholders, but also by the hard effort of women and men who work. The interplay be between business and society has profound implications on governments, nations, and indeed the world. Pursuing stories with curiosity, persistence, and enthusiasm, raising questions about what doesn't make sense, widening the range of sources, and explaining the stories in clear terms is the duty of all journalists. Political journalism isn't all about bad news. Business journalism isn't all about good news. The two affect one another and its consequences reverberate through the landscape. And good journalists, like the canaries in coal mine, can identify those rumblings that foretell the tremors. Theirs is not to set the world right. Their role is to tell those stories and in the process comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable so that it is a slightly better world tomorrow than what it was yesterday. Journalists have to be the bridge, uh, have to bridge the difference between the stock market and the bazaar, between the investor and the consumer, and give voice to the voiceless, recognize the power of the powerless, and give space to those who have the rights but are denied access. It is a noble calling. May this guidance help journalists to discover newer ways of looking at stories that must be told. Thank you. Alil, thank you so much for um, sharing those big insights with us um, early in the morning for you. And you did a, a wonderful job painting the picture of um, just how uh, big hitting these business and human rights stories have been over uh, just over the last decades um, and uh, the critical role of journalism in empowering readers and listeners and watchers to make informed choices in their lives. Uh, journalists challenging assertions. That was my big takeaway from, from those thoughts that you shared. So uh, a huge appreciation to you, Salil Tripathi, for joining us very early in the morning for you. Um, and now I want to go straight into that, uh, that aspect that you highlighted for us uh, in your remarks, and that is this guidance, this handbook that uh, the UN Development Program has produced to support exactly what you're calling for, which is uh, that journalists uh, go out there, challenge assumptions, take a tough look at the behavior of companies, of corporations, how they impact people's lives, their fundamental dignity. And there's some know-how to be able to do that, some things that a journalist or an editor needs to consider. And that's why this handbook exists. So at this moment, I'm really proud to bring in two people who have spearheaded the development of this handbook, which is being released today. And those people are Harpreet Kaur, who is a business and human rights specialist at the UN Development Program's Regional Bureau of Asia and Pacific. Um, good evening, Harpreet. And Nick Raystrick, who is the author of the handbook. Um, Nick is a writer, editor, and trainer with a focus on humanitarian media, joining us from the UK. So um, to both of you, a very warm welcome and big thank you for um, spearheading this tremendous work. Harpreet, I want to turn to you. Um, tell us about what journalists and editors can find immediately concretely helpful about this handbook that UNDP is releasing today. Thanks, Julie, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are in. That's the thing with this online events, you don't know how to wish people. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining us today. And Julie, actually, before I answer your question, 
you know, I would like to take this opportunity to formally launch the UNDP's handbook, Reporting Business and Human Rights, um, a handbook for journalists, communicators, and campaigners, but also take this opportunity to thank everyone for making this happen. You know, Nick Kreistrick, who's here, um, you know, on uh, here with us for conceptualizing and writing and actually for producing various versions of it, you know, for Rick Mary for his design, media professionals who gave us their time to share their experiences, to journalists who validated our various drafts, and last but not the least, uh, you know, our colleagues, Livio Sarandria, Kevin Lehman, Suparak Vesarat, Amy Selmer, who have been working uh, not just for, you know, on the, during the last couple of weeks, but actually for almost a year working on this. So thank you, everyone. Really, really excited to launch this um, handbook today. Um, you know, coming back to your question, Julie, I'm actually glad, you know, you asked this question because that was our exact brief and we embarked on this journey to promote business and human rights reportage. You know, um, whether a journalist is reporting on lifestyle or politics, education, finance, there is likely a business and human rights story. But to report such a story requires a distinctive set of skills and tools. And that is what this handbook offers. You know, it offers you tools on how to spot such stories, how to pitch stories to your editors, how to research, how to interview, nurturing and protecting your sources, but also safeguarding yourself. You know, um, as, we, as we've heard many a times, no, no story is worth your life, but then also to remain curious and empathetic, yet fair and balanced. Um, you know, I think one of the key, um, and thanks to Nick for that, I think Nick has put in a lot of hard work to make sure that the handbook is really easy to follow and jargon free, uh, which as you know, you know, many of these uh, big reports and documents that we work at the UN, you know, you do find many of these jargons. So I think that's something, um, you know, that this handbook provides, you know, it, it really consolidates the wisdom and experiences of practitioners and provide practical tips to implement in one place. Um, you know, for example, um, on page 114, you will and we'll share the link, um, you know, to download the report in a minute, you know, in, in a couple of minutes uh, towards the end of the session. But you know, I'll just give you an example. On page 114, you will find a reporting business and human rights checklist, which is a great resource for new and seasoned journalists alike. But you could practically use it for you know any reportage, and it's kind of a checklist that as journalists can actually use for any other, uh, you know, for any other issue that they're working on. Um, again, interviews with media professionals show the connection between the concept and the practice. And I think one of the key things that, you know, all the interviews that are there from, um, from the media professionals in this handbook is that they've laid out both uh, the challenges while reporting on these stories, but also the strategies to overcome. So I think that's a really handy tool for, you know, for many journalists who would be, uh, who would be looking at it later. This hand provides tools that will help journalists perform their, job perform their job better. And hopefully it will get them to start thinking about how they can cover important business and human rights related to their beings. Um, trust me, this handbook will not help journalists, communicators, or campaigners become experts on business and human rights. Oh, we certainly don't want them to be taking on our jobs. We want them to remain journalists, but we hope that you know, this, this handbook will give them a sense of how to get started and where to look if they want to go further. Um, thanks, Julie, for that question. Thank you, Harpreet. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it getting really concrete and practical. So you raised sort of some of the key contours of what readers can expect of immediately helpful um, advice, stories, um, references that uh, readers of this handbook can access. Nick, I want to turn to you. you. You put this together. You went really deep in doing the interviews with the media professionals, combing the literature. Um, Give me the headline, so to speak. What were some of your uh, big takeaways having put together this document that you think um, you want to share today, this evening with media professionals? Uh, well, thanks for the introduction, Harpy. And uh, yeah, th thanks for um, hiring me, obviously. Uh, first thing is the struggle is real, ongoing, and it is everywhere. So as the speech has alluded to uh, from Salil, some humans have always exploited some humans for money, just as some people have always stepped in on behalf of the exploiting culture, either allows this to happen or speaks out about it, importantly, in a way that ordinary people can relate to. So that's one thing I want to make sure that people take away from this. Let's get out of the bubble of people whose interest or career is to work in human rights. People got fast internet and an hour to spend on a, on, a, on a launch, but it's about kind of ordinary people. Secondly, it is about every sector and it's the big and the little story. So I've 
I mean, I work as a journalism trainer, but I've reported on most things. My first paid journalism gig was in football commentary, which is a job that everyone but me wanted. It's duller than you think, um, because only so much happens in a football match. And you've got to speak to disappointed players who hate journalists. So it's kind of good practice, really. Anyway, football. I play on a football pitch that uses these little plastic crumbs. Um, and someone said, no, it's, it's, it's cool. They find these plastic crumbs. It's recycled tyres. And someone else said, well, it's, it's microplastics. And actually, you know, both, it's, both are true. It's microplastics that end up in the, in, in the sea. So spotting the story and seeing through the spin is really important. That's just one example. But take football. You could talk about who makes the stadia, who makes your boots. Choose another subject. There's business and human rights angles everywhere. Um, thirdly, business and human rights, reporting it well, involves upsetting people. If you do it right. Some people don't want you talking about the exploitation of a particular ethnic group or some people in government don't want to acknowledge that they cut down trees because they profit from it, you know, directly and indirectly. And uh, yeah, people are good at creating both direct and indirect censorship and it's a constant battle of differing positions and interests. So it can be quite stressful and bruising. And finally, have I got enough time for one more? Go for it. Creative storytelling. So we forget that even news and factual reporting is a creative business. Um, I talk about a BBC program. I mean, I'm ex-BBC, um, but I haven't worked there for years. So I'm not, you know, I'm not gaining from bigging them up here. Um, they sent fashion addict teenagers to look at sweatshops. And I talk about this in the handbook. And journalists like me are like, oh, that's so unfair. Uh, because they know nothing. And, and they didn't know anything about the topic at all. But the audiences loved watching them learn. And it really captured the imagination. This is like a young audience who not in a million years would have Googled business and human rights. People don't Google business and human rights. Most people don't care. We're in a virtual room of people with an interest in the topic, but you've really got to sell that story. So think about your audience. Think about what they're like, whether it's football or fashion or, or whatever, and, and take some risks in your, in your storytelling. Because otherwise, if you use the language of... Um, let's say many documents about human rights, people just won't engage with it and don't care. So we have to remember that you've got to sell the story a little bit. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. Great. Um, very, very concrete there. I love it. I'm, I'm feeling back in my newsroom in, in the days of yore with immediate, immediately relevant um, reflections from you. So thank you, Nick. Um, I am conscious of the time. I want to get to our amazing panelists of journalists. Um, but before we do that, Harpreet, I want to give you a chance to just talk to us about logistics. Um, we've, we've tried to raise some interest for the, the handbook and this topic that UNDP has put forward. How can um, people with us today and their colleagues um, access the, these support materials? Is there further work on this from UNDP that our audience can expect? Sure. Thanks, Julie. Um, for us, the development and the launch of the handbook is really the first step. You know, um, Of course, the handbook can be downloaded from our website, and I'd be grateful if someone from the team can actually share the web link in the chat here. Um, you know, following this, we plan to organize trainings at a regional level and to begin with a train the trainers, um, you know, where... Uh, where trainers and instructors would be trained so that they're equipped to use this handbook for trainings that you know, we hope they organize in future at national and local levels. We would also invite academics from journalism schools to explore the possibility of, you know, of introducing the handbook or certain modules from the handbook in, in their ongoing courses as well. Uh, early next year with these trainers and instructors, we would launch country level trainings to be delivered through asynchronous blended learning approaches. So there's quite a lot you know, in, the, in the pipeline. I think it would also be interesting to explore the possibility of organizing field visits during these trainings and facilitate peer learning opportunities for journalists. I think that's something that we haven't seen a lot happening, at least in Asia on business and human rights. So we would like to bring together journalists from different uh, countries and, and you know, just have those peer learning uh, experiences together. Uh, perhaps even introduce fellowships at a certain stage. We definitely do want to translate the handbook in various Asian languages. And really lastly, you know, we would welcome any other ideas to disseminate the handbook widely and support a network of journalists reporting on business and human rights issues. So a lot is in the pipeline. Um, stay tuned in. Thanks, Harpreet. Okay, so stay tuned. There is more to come. Um, and uh, as you have ideas perhaps coming in about how you'd like to engage with this material, maybe you've been inspired, uh, maybe you have ideas about um, furthering its uptake and use across uh, for media professionals, campaigners, communicators, you can also take a moment and put it in the chat. Remember, at any time, you can interact with us by typing into the chat 
whether it's a question for one of our speakers or whether it's a, a sort of an organizational question and the team from UNDP can get straight back to you on that one. So I wanna thank Harpreet and Nick. Uh, this was short, but let's not underestimate the sheer amount of labor and love that went into producing uh, this handbook. And I wanna congratulate you and the whole team around you for doing that. Everybody do be sure to access that. The link has just gone up in the Zoom chat. So uh, before you get completely distracted and dive into the handbook, I want to take uh, the next moment to welcome our panel, because these are three incredible women journalists um, from India, from Bangladesh, from Thailand, who have experience reporting business and human rights stories, some of them many decades of experience and some of them just one story. And in this upcoming panel, we're gonna be talking about how they as reporters, uh, journalists, editors, went about covering those stories, their key considerations, maybe some of the challenges they faced. So at this moment, I'm really pleased to welcome Anuba Bosle, who is the founder of Newsworthy, joining us from Delhi. Sushmita S. Prita, who is the impact editor at the Daily Star in Dhaka and Kritika Klotre, who is a freelance reporter based out of Thailand. So um, to all of you, uh, very, very nice to have you with us. Thank you for joining us uh, in the evening for you. It's a real um, pleasure. So I want to really just kick off by giving you all a chance to introduce yourselves, to tell us a little bit about your journalistic background, and then maybe share with us your origin story, how you began with this whole business and human rights things. For some of you, I know it was very recent. For some of you, it's been a long time. You're quite an expert in this space. So give us a, a brief background on how you find yourself in the position today of talking about your business and human rights reporting. Um, so Anuba, if you can kick off for us, please do go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Julian. It's been fascinating. You've been listening right uh, since Salit set out that white picture for us, and I'm extremely privileged to be here. Thank you. Um, as you've introduced, I'm coming here from Delhi. Uh, this is now my home, my office, my workplace, my everything. Uh, I am an independent journalist. I am the founder of Newsworthy. I have about uh, 20 odd years of experience, uh, essentially in legacy media, in mainstream newsrooms. Um, Newsworthy is essentially a digital storytelling platform. It is on social media and very simply tells stories that matter. Um, it is intersectional. It has one thumb rule looking at public interest. And I think that's sort of the ethos of my entire journalistic career. I often find it hard to sort of put myself in a bracket of a journalist who's done business or who's done business in human rights or is a political journalist or is a social sector journalist. But I think my focus on inequity, my focus always on foregrounding people's voices and experiences um, and the fact that public interest is sort of foremost in every story that I may have covered on the ground or I may have edited for other journalists, um, I think sort of puts me in a place where I find a place in this particular panel. I do have a stronger sort of work on human rights having been uh, covering some of the stories in India that come from the northeast of our country in the north of our country where there are low intensity conflicts that have been on and they could be sort of categorized as specific human rights stories. But I think over the course of my career, I found PESA, which is money, power, which could be polit political power or corporate power, people and politics all intermingle. Um, so I think with with that, I'll rest it here and I'll, I'd love to listen to the other panelists. Absolutely. Thank you, Anuba, for joining us from your office, home, et cetera, um, as we all are doing these days, aren't we? Um, so I now want to turn, um, Kritika, I'd like to turn from to you joining us today from Thailand. You've got a pretty different background compared to Anuba. Um, tell us a bit about yourself as a, as a reporter and then how you got into covering a business and human rights story. Hi, um, my name is Kritika Klot, and thank you everyone uh, from all over the, the world for joining us. Well, I, just, I have uh, five years of um, experience in journalism and I was working for, I've been working for, I had been working for international news desk for Thai media and Thai TV channels, uh, including national broadcast services of Thailand and also other private agencies. 
and in Thailand also. And I was responsible for reporting international events related to Thailand, including human rights issue, and then I presented on TV. Well, I was a presenter as well. But Thailand has a lot of foreign migrants, and most of them are from neighboring countries. They come here, um, most of them work in factories, and they are, as you all know, they are vulnerable groups um, facing issues like potential human rights abuse, and that's why I got into it, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Kritika, for giving us that perspective. And now, Prita, I want to turn to you joining us from Dhaka. Great to have you with us. Um, tell us a little bit about your background as a journalist and um, how you became quite quite a business and human rights expert, I would say. Give us a brief origin story there. Uh, sure, thanks for inviting me to this really timely panel. Um, I'm actually not even a journalist by uh, training. I sort of stumbled upon journalism a decade ago uh, when I was a young and idealistic anthropologist interested in making sense of and telling stories about the world. Um, a year into my career, a fire broke out at Tazreen Factory, who were producing clothes for a range of international brands, including Walmart, CNA, Lian Fang, and Cake. The fire killed at least 117 workers and injured more than 200 others. Gates were locked, um, windows on the lower floor were barred, and there were no emergency exits. Hundreds had to jump from the windows of the upper floors. Many were burned beyond recognition, and several of them were never identified. Um, I spent months with the families of those so-called missing people and saw firsthand their desperate attempt to get some closure. Uh, and then five months later, Rana Plaza happened, and Salil gave a, a, a brief but very moving overview of that incident. Um, and for months after the rescue operation, you could still sort of like, um, you know, you could still smell the corpses in the air. Um, and, and for years after, or like years later now, I can still smell those corpses sometimes, like those triggers appear. Um, so it might sound cliche, but Tazrin and Rana Plaza had a profound impact on me. Uh, it made me really question my own complicity in enabling such an oppressive industry to function. Uh, so that's really when I started following labor issues more closely, um, focusing more particularly on the transnational supply chain and how they not only allow such violences to happen, but make them almost inevitable. Um, I think it's really important that we stop normalizing these violences and hold institutions from large companies to small suppliers accountable. Um, and so throughout my career, both as a journalist and then as a researcher, um, I've, I've tracked labor issues and I've tried to tell a bigger story than what appears to the eyes. Um, so when I was reporting, I covered labor issues. When I was writing op-eds, um, I wrote op-eds. When I was an editor of a news magazine, I made sure that you know labor stories or the workers' perspective um, came through in in everything that we did. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's sort of my origin story, and that's where that's where I'm at. Terrific. Thank you, Prita. And actually, I want to keep you in the spotlight here for a moment because I want to mm -hmm. pose the first follow-up question to you. And by the way, a reminder to our audience, I see you engaging here in the chat. Keep doing that. Keep sending us your questions and comments. Also for our speakers, do not hesitate. Um, but Prita, I want to come back to you. You sort of finished up by crystallizing how you came into this actually galvanized by a very, very mm -hmm. clear story about a a business having very severe impacts on human lives. And uh, that was uh, your catalyst to get in and, and become, uh, do, do reporting um, and, and be an editor as well. So in your view, I have the sense that you see a business and human rights angle to many stories. But of course, you also, through your work at Media Houses, you have to maybe sell that a bit to um, colleagues, to editors, to other reporters. How um, can reporters and editors see a business and human rights angle in an ordinary story, as Salil referenced, in a story about an earnings report from a company, in a story about clashes between workers and an employer at a factory? How do we see that angle amidst the obvious headline? Right, like for me, as you said, like I see business and human rights stories everywhere, right? Like if you're willing to ask the difficult questions, if you're really willing to see, uh, then they're just, they're everywhere. So if I just look around myself, even the electricity that I take for granted comes at a very high price to the uh, environment and communities at the margins, because with less than 4% of power in Bangladesh being generated through renewables. The tea I drink, for instance, is being picked up and packaged by women earning less than um, one euro per day who have no access to toilet facilities in the tea gardens. The shrimp I ate for lunch is being cultivated in the southern region of the country and is being endorsed and funded by multilateral and aid agencies such as the World Bank, ADB, but it has caused salinity levels in those regions to go up. 
Um, and, you know, it's displaced communities, agricultural lands are gone, plants and trees are dying. Um, so, I mean, for me, those stories are everywhere. And I'm always, um, and I'm always fighting with editors and I'm fighting with my colleagues to make sure that we, they, they see those stories. And it's, it's, it's been an uphill battle, I'm not gonna lie. It's been an uphill battle because at the end of the day, um, not everyone uh, works in an independent um, organization. Not everyone has, uh, has uh, access to, um, yeah, so access to those kind of storytelling platforms. Um, so operating in corporate media is sort of difficult and you have to always negotiate, always um, um, try to convince your editors that this is a story worth telling and this is a story worth uh, uh, making enemies uh, over. Um, but practically speaking, like how do you find new angles for your investigations, right? So it's one thing, there are some um, stories that are always already out there. You just need to go and find those stories. But sometimes it becomes difficult to find new angles, right? So the RMG sector, you re everyone's written about it. What's new? How can I find something new to write about it? Um, of course, there are the usual ways um, that any journalist follows a story, like cultivating sources within the industry, putting Google alerts to track developments in the sector, et cetera, stuff like that. Uh, but one way I do it is I, I really track protests, not just big ones that make it to the headlines, but I also uh, small protests that come up in online portals or in social media platforms or, you know, um, that my union activist friends are talking about. Um, the protests in themselves may seem too insignificant to report, but they may lead you to a bigger story about a sector-wise violation. For example, a small protest about forced overtime in one factory um, can lead you to a bigger story about how during the pandemic employers in many factories were using the threat of dismissal um, to get workers to work um, X amount of overtime without pay every day, amounting to millions of dollars in wage theft. Uh, the same with press releases. There may be a press release about a report launched by a research institute, which on the onset looks you know, really boring. You don't even want to go over it. But if you dig deep, you might be surprised with the kind of data they highlight, and subsequently, they may lead you to, a, to your own investigation. And another thing that I think is really helpful, especially for business journalists, because I'm not a business journalist, I'm, I always look at businesses with suspicion, but I know a lot of business journalists don't always do that. But I think it's really important for them to scrutinize the claims that companies make about upholding rights, right? And all of the CSR activities that they do, I think it's really important that we don't take them at their face value. So when a big fashion brand like H&M launches a campaign on ensuring living wages within five years in their supply chain, I think it is our duty to follow up at the end of five years, whether they've instituted it or whether they have now replaced their straightforward claim with somewhat vague um, claims about ensuring transparency in wages in their supply chain, you know? So our job as journalists aren't to simply reiterate the corporate speak that these companies are so good at. It's really to go to the source and call out their hypocrisies. Um, and then I think you really have to learn to read between the news, right? So like a front page news says, one worker was injured in a so-called clash between protesters and police, and you could just gloss over it. It's just one worker. I mean, thousands of workers get beaten up in Bangladesh on, you know, like a monthly basis. So why bother about this one worker? Um, but then I followed up with this worker, and this worker, Kanchan Mia, he works for an RMG factory that's owned by the Hameen Group and produces for some of the biggest global brands, um, is now fighting for his life. The surgeons at the hospital removed as many as 101 pellets from his intestines and a large part of his intestine and the lower abdomen had to be removed surgically to save his life. Um, for the rest of his life, he won't be able to do any hard work. And since the first surgery, he can pass urine and stool only to an external bag attached, attached to his punctured abdomen. Um, so he probably now needs a second surgery. Uh, he has COVID. And it's, at this point, we're not sure if he's going to survive. And he has a family of seven who has spent everything they have and, and, and more um, to, to save his life. But, you know, in the end, probably it won't come to any use. The factory is only, is trying to obviously shirk responsibility. Um, so those are the kinds of stories, you know, that, that kind of, you can easily mi miss. 
mm-hmm. or the call mm-hmm. to prayer. I'll, I'll just stop here because the call to prayer is kind of distracting. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. No worries. But Preet, look, you've, you've given us a, a lot to think about and I really appreciate that. And, and we'll let that background noise uh, take its place. Um, but, you know, Preet, I think what's so interesting is like you described, you see business and human rights stories everywhere and calling on other media professionals to dig in, to question assumptions, just as Salil also laid out for us at the top, to dig deep. Um, I want to say one point, and then I'm going to turn to Kritika for a follow-up question because you offer a very different experience. Um, by the way, um, Preeta was talking a lot about the RMG sector. For those of you who are not familiar, <clears throat> pardon me, that's a ready-made garment, which is also referred to as fas- fashion. Um, so Kritika, um, I want to turn to you. Thank you for joining us today from Thank Phuket you. in Thailand. Um, you have an experience which is, um, if I may say, sort of more of a of a regular reporter who was working at an international desk. Um, and yes, human rights were part of your beat, you could say among other critical international news stories. And um, back in, I think it was 2017, you were assigned a story about some issues um, with workers uh, at a chicken farm. And, and then you went about and tried to cover that story the way that I think any uh, reasonable reporter would without having a specialty, a background, um, academic research in the space of business and human rights. So a nice contrast to what Preeta, for example, brings in for us. Tell us how with this story, you know, you get assigned the story. How did you go about trying to cover it? Who did you feel you needed to talk to? Um, How did you ascertain, you know, what's the angle here? How did you work with your editors to determine what the story was? Mm -hmm. I think um, with my editor and and the reporter team, we were kind of having conversation like human rights issue is very, very complicated. And it's it's always had different sides of the stories, you know. So for me, it's very important to to talk to all related parties, not just to talk, not just talk to um, the employees, but the employers as well. And for me, well, I'm from, I have a TV background, right? I think it's very important to utilizing multimedia formats to portray the story. And we, we have noticed that every time the story goes on TV with like beautiful visual uh, thing, it has, it has bigger impact than just um, article or uh, other formats. Thank you for that, Kritika. And I, I see some um, questions coming in. I just want to clarify that um, this is um, a little bit of a, a very prominent story that Kritika covered. I'm going to say a few brief words about it, but not go into too much detail. Um, so this was a story about um, labor rights abuses allegations at a chicken farm in Thailand. Um, and um, after Kritika covered that story for a few months, she was named as one of as several other individuals in um, a case uh, brought against them by the um, by the owner of that factory. And as that case is still in court, we're not going to go into a lot of detail and we're not going to name names to that. So that is out of respect for your situation, Kritika. Um, but we're going to come back in our conversation to talk about the risks that journalists face and you have and are facing those risks when they report on these kinds of stories where um, company claims and company behavior is challenged and shown not always to be positive. Um, So for for a moment here, I wanna turn back to Anuba. Um, You have a very deep experience, um, you know, and you you painted for us brilliantly, what is a public interest story? Um, What are the various angles that come together to paint, to to constitute a story that the public needs to hear? Um, And uh, I think that those of us, uh, I count myself among them who are passionate about um, reporting on business impacts on people's lives, feel this is an important story and it should be covered, but it probably doesn't feel that way to sort of a hard charging editor or um, a media house that has also commercial pressures and commercial concerns. Um, You have a very strong uh, background uh, in editorial leadership as well as the former executive editor of CNN IBN in India. And uh, you've had a lot of story pitches in your life and taken a lot of tough editorial decisions. Um, What is your sense? You're passionate about public interest reporting. Um, Business and human rights is a form of public interest reporting. 
how uh, can reporters pitch this story effectively, highlighting the newsworthy angle of it while recognizing the complex human rights issues that constitute the story? Julie, I've had lots of pitches in front of me and rejected them and accepted them. And the same has been done to me as well, right? So um, I think I first want to sort of acknowledge that there are a whole host of journalists who are working on the ground in extremely tough conditions. And these ideas, these stories, uh, these pitches with that public interest lens and with the groundwork already exists with them. One of the reasons we may find that they don't exist in the framework that we're talking about, uh, there's a reason for that. And one of the reasons we don't find them in the public space is that, you know, there is an interplay, as everyone has spoken about, between corporations and journalism, between media that's corporate owned. We must remember reporters are also workers in the media industry, and they are going to be subjected to the pressures that come in from owners of publication. Those pressures may be overt or implicit or not, but often the one big problem for many of these stories, not seeing the light of day is not the reporter so much, maybe not even the editor, but is actually a structural issue of how media is designed today. So companies are essentially potential clients, right? Potential clients who are giving advertising. So that's number one. Number two, and this is uh, this is not a this is not a blanket uh, statement that I'm making. I think by and large across geographies, you will find that we have accepted this norm that you cannot question companies. You cannot question them stridently. If they are questioned, as Salil said, they have to be, um, you know, they have to be mollycoddled with talking points, good lighting, suit, a good place to sit, um, and it, everything has to be sort of crystal clear and perfect. I think. Again, not a, not a blanket statement, but I think by and large, we have sort of accepted this as a norm. And I think contrast that with, and this is a problem in journalism across geographies. I think we spend far more time in getting the powerful right than we spend in getting ordinary citizens right, right? Which is not to say that um, do not get all facts in place, um, but I think we just sort of hold um, companies, corporates, CEOs with a kid glove that we don't quite use with ordinary citizens or, uh, you know, victims of any particular incident. Um, the third thing, and this sort of speaks more directly to what you have asked in terms of pitches, I think number one is uh, you cannot pitch this as a business and human rights story. I mean, uh, any editor would sort of just put it in a draft box or put it in a folder that they keep on their desktop I would not recommend pitching it as a business or human rights story. Uh, you know, the idea I, I'm sure of this handbook is, is not to create a silo, right? We're not trying to create a silo of stories that could be construed as responsible business because then you'll have a problem of greenwashing and you'll have an entire page that is of stories that is sort of uh, moving away from the point. The idea of, of this handbook or the idea of any pitch that any journalist has uh, and I'm not saying something novel, I'm not saying something exciting, is to foreground the hook, foreground people's voices. Uh, we live in, uh, you know, we live in a scenario where multimedia is such an often used word, but I think uh, the juice of multimedia is the fact that today you can uh, use an audio material and find a source who will play that story. You can capture documents and make a slideshow out of it. You can keep a story going and give it legs for a longer period of time. Uh, ultimately, I think it's, um, it, you know, I, I, I think uh, it, it's uh, it's one of the speakers who said that, you know, don't dismiss, uh, don't dismiss the small things. I think for me as a journalist, I have often realized that if you, um, if you are constant, if your list has diverse sources, you know, if you're not going back to the same people who sort of fill your comfort zone, you're likely to find more leads. Uh, if you look at any product and follow it completely down to its supply chain, you are likely to find more. Uh, often it happens with business journalists is that we go back to organizations or representatives that represent uh, 
that represent business interests, right? So if it's a corporate story, you'll go back to in India, a CII or a FIKI. But there are a whole host of organizations that are protecting the interests of the marginalized communities, that are protecting uh, interests of women workers, etc. And again, put them through the same scrutiny that you would put everyone through. Uh, but also put CEOs, uh, et cetera, also through the same scrutiny. One more thing I want to sort of just highlight that I think we should use this great handbook, this great material, these great insights, uh, not just for business sector journalists, you know, not just for business journalists, because I think what's needed is sort of breaking these silos. Social sector journalists will also find great merit in uh you know in combing through company documents and finding disclosures and finding a great insight there that could then take them to the ground and they'll find a beautiful story yeah thank you so much for that um anuba a key takeaway i, I i'm recalling my old editor saying what's the news angle again and, and your thing about yeah you probably don't want to package it as a business and human rights story, even though you know that those issues ultimately are in play. Um, but there is, of course, a certain element of what makes a successful pitch. It has to feel newsworthy to, to not to pun on the name of your outstanding organization. Um, and, and so on that, you raised some really, I think, practical and relevant points there about especially complexities around um, sources and information gathering, which is also raised quite a bit in the handbook from UNDP. When you cover, I'll, I'll call it as a shorthand, a business and human rights story, um, you're needing to get information from a very broad range of sources that's perhaps a bit distinctive to this type of uh, reporting. Um, and Prita, I wanna turn uh, back to you. You've been doing a lot of reporting um, on, on business and human rights stories and are probably fairly practiced at understanding the breadth of uh, the kind of source relationships that you need to have to get the information you need. And also um, not just human sources, but then information sources, whether it's very dense financial documentation from corporations all the way through to, um, you know, attending um, an informal meeting of community members who are exchanging information about which factory is the better place to work. Um, talk us through a little bit that those practicalities, uh, the, the human sources and the information sources that you need to cultivate to do the storytelling well. Uh, so, Prita, you're on mute. Uh, so, okay. So I'll, I'll start with one of the challenges that I have because I'm not a business reporter and people tend to see me as more of a human rights, you know, researcher, activist, so on. Um, so the business people don't really uh, take to me so well. I mean, they often refuse to give me comments. So that's one of the challenges that, that happens when you do, uh, when you do the, these, kind of, this, these kind of things. So, um, oftentimes that actually does pose a challenge because I, I, I have a story ready, but I need the comment of the, the, you know, like the owner's association and the owner's association to simply not give me a comment. Um, so then I'd have to, you know, reach out to my business um, colleagues um, who do maintain good relations with them and then get a comment. So um, there is that risk of you, um, you know, at, at one point or the other, you will make an enemy out of someone and, and, and they will try to make sure that you can't run your story because you, you can't run your story without their comments, right? Um, so we have to find ways to sort of circumvent that. Um, I try to, as I said, like I try to, I, I try to maintain relationships with a host of, you know, actors, including, of course, business people, less so, but um, local unions, and that can be, you know, the more NGOized unions that can be really small unions that are more, more left-leaning and that they, they don't have registrations, but they may, may have a point of view, right? Because um, these big N these big NGOized unions uh, have a lot to lose and maybe they're under um, greater scrutiny of the government. Maybe they can't speak up, maybe they can't take to the streets, but maybe a small left-leaning union can because, you know, um, they're smaller in number, they're not that much of a threat. So maybe they'll be more willing to speak up on certain issues. Um, I do try to go straight to the source. So the workers, I do maintain my relationships with workers. I do take them quite seriously. And I do think we, uh, we owe it to them to not just, um, you know, tell their stories right, but also follow up later about what happens to them. Um, so over the years, I have, I have cultivated a lot of um, relationships and i I call them not just to ask what's happening in their factories, but to ask what's happening in the community 
um, what are some of the key concerns that they're talking about? Because I think, um, you know, when you hear the voices from the bottom, it helps you frame your story in a way that you would not otherwise frame. So I, I go there and then, you know, build up. Um, so one of the challenges in reporting, for instance, um, uh, about sectors that are export oriented, right, because they bring in a lot of GDP to the country and they're really celebrated nationally, as, as Salil pointed out, you know, Bangladesh is a success story because of um, the success of the RMG sector and success of some other sectors as well. So when you want to tell these really complex stories, you want to tell stories about how workers' rights are being violated, not just by, um, not just by factories, but also state institutions you are putting yourself at risk, but more than the risk to myself, I'm putting my contacts at risk, right? So when I'm calling them, a lot of these people don't have access to, say for instance, WhatsApp or, or Signal or um, a Telegram. So how do I contact them? I contact them over phone and then maybe nothing happens to me because I have you know, powerful contacts. I know Salil, Salil can help me out if, um, if they file a case against me, but what happens to the worker who gets picked up because they spoke to me or they spoke to uh, an, a researcher with connections with international um, campaign organizations. Um, and so because of my campaign organization background as well, for three years, I worked as the country representative of the Worker Rights Consortium, which is an international labor rights body. I did a lot of investigations um, into that factory violations, which meant talking to workers outside of the factories, of course, because once you talk to factories, uh, when you talk to um, workers in the factories, for obvious reasons, they don't tell you what's really going on. Um, and we also have to documents. And I won't say I really understand a lot of this because as I said, I don't have a business background. Um, but you know, like looking at aud audit reports, looking at you know, sort of trying to, trying to see if what's there on paper matches up with what the workers are claiming, right? So if the workers are claiming well, I'm working 12-hour shifts every day, but then, you know, the timesheets that the uh, the company is producing says they're working eight hours per day. Um, you know, it can be, a, oh, he says and they say story, but it's not a he, he say, they, they say story. There's obviously something else that's going on. Um, so one way I, I, we went around it is we, uh, we provided workers with timesheets where, you know, they essentially filled out um, when they were going in and when they were, coming out and we cross reference that with you know the timesheets that were provided by the um by the factories and we saw that there was a huge gap uh like billions of not billions like millions of dollars worth of wage theft that had happened um so i think um business reporters are in a better are better position in a lot of ways than uh, than reporters who come from my background because they understand those kind of documents better right so they'll be able to sort of look at a document and see where some of the anomalies may, may, may lie. Preeta, thank you for that very practical um, information for us. And also we had a question come in from the audience while you were speaking about um, do's and don'ts for human rights organizations reporting mm -hmm. and campaigning on business and human rights issues. Um, mm -hmm. And I think some of the, the practical practices that you've just shared with us about mm -hmm. cultivating relationships with sources, um, recognizing ways to keep vulnerable sources as safe as possible, um, being willing to um, comb through uh, what's on paper, triangulation, you know, comparing, well, does this information source match that information source? Um, also relevant, I would say, for um, a human rights organization um, or a campaigning organization, you kind of marry those two backgrounds yourself. And it sounds like you've uh, continued some of those practices, whether it was as it was a campaigner or in, in media reporting. So thanks a lot for, for giving us that overview, Prita. Now, one thing that you highlighted in your remarks was risk. And I want to take a minute. I, I don't want to um, miss this part because I think, Kritika, this is something that we need to hear from you and we want to learn about as much as you're able, of course, given um, the current um, pending case. Um, I will just uh, summarize very briefly, and then I have a question about support from employers, which uh, journalists very much need when they face this kind of um, this this kind of challenge after just trying to do their jobs. Um, and so, in this situation that began in 2017 with the story of uh, alleged labor rights abuses at a chicken farm in Thailand, you were named in in some um, court filings there. And uh, for example, um, uh, one judgment that has come down, which is now under appeal, as I understand it, was a two-year prison sentence. Um, so this is a, not a small matter. 
um, and you are the only reporter named in that case. Um, and um, I uh, want to sort of ask the question, what was the support like that you got from your employer or, or other media professionals um, through this experience? Um, it has to have been, and I think continues to be very difficult. Um, but of course, uh, ostensibly reporters should be able to do their jobs and report on public interest stories, just as um, Anuba and Prita and all of our speakers today have emphasized. What would you call on for particularly the employers of reporters, but also the media profession broadly to ensure that journalists can do this critical reporting? I think the least important, but well, a bit, uh, it's also important is mental support because unfortunately, um, when many fellow journalists in Thailand learned that this kind of um, litigation is happening to me, they came to me, especially women journalists, they came to me and they said that, you know what, I face threats. Um, some of them are facing litigation also, also but their employees um, don't provide any help at all. Not even, I'm not even talking about legal support, but mental support, you know, so they are told to go away with it by themselves and, and, and they have um, a big fear if, if they can really do, the, do that or not. Yeah. So obviously when you face threats like this, in my case, um, I, I felt pretty lonely, you know, if, if you don't like, if, if you don't know who, you, you felt like um, you don't know who to turn to. You don't know what to do. And obviously you have like so many doubts in your head going on and on like, is this my fault? Is, am I really doing a bad job or is this just a bad luck? You know, so mental support is, is very important, but it's not enough. So going back to what I said before that, Many journalists, when they are sued, they are often left alone here. So I think employer could set up a legal department or a legal person who stand by for help legally and financially as well. And it should be written in the contract, you know, for journalists. So they could, especially for human rights journalists, because we are so vulnerable. So they would feel like, okay, then I'm protected. I can, I can do my job. Um, hopefully, right? But I think the most important thing is the employer must educate their journalists about how to report such um, sensitive issue and, and be safe to avoid litigation, which I think the guidebook that we are launching today is very, very helpful. Because as far as I know, I mean, at least in Thailand, nobody, well, I'm not speaking about all media agencies, right? But many that I know of, nobody tells or trains their journalists or even providing guidelines about how to cover this kind of issue safely, especially for junior journalists who didn't have a lot of experiences, which I was back then, right? So yeah, I think this is the most important part because when you face threats or lawsuits, you're, you're discouraged you know, to report more on such issues. And, and what could happen to the society if 100 journalists um, having the same doubt, you know? So like finally, who could end up being the voice of vulnerable? Yeah, thanks very much, Kritika, for sharing that um, story. And um, I, you know, you've raised um, the risks and challenges that uh, that reporters face that you have a very faced in a very real context in covering these stories. Um, we've had an audience question come in as well that I kind of want to roll into a question. I think that I'm going to pose back to Anuba here, um, and and that question has to do with ensuring that especially the next generation of journalists um, are prepared to cover these stories, uh, acknowledging the complexity of doing that coverage, acknowledging the risks they may undertake. You've been involved in training materials um, for um, journalists, uh, specifically in India, on covering business and human rights stories. So you, you've uh, really gone specific with this. But of course, I think in your decades of being a journalist, um, you've seen um, the sector evolve, you've seen what kind of skills reporters need as they come up. Um, so what do you think for our younger set of reporters and media professionals in our audience today, what do they need to be aware of in terms of skills they're going to need to do this kind of critical public interest reporting um, and uh, how they can manage the risks that we've just heard about one example from Kritika? Um, Julie, um, maybe if I could just take the risks Sure. Vis a vis yourself and the sources first. And I, um, I'm only going to rely on uh, personal experience and what, what sort of the camaraderie of journalists is and how what we share with each other, right? Um, I think uh, 
my experience has taught me the greater you rely on technology to communicate, the more the risk is of you or your source being found out. Uh, you know, I hate to say this and I hate to sound like an old foggy, but I think some of the old school ways of contacting your sources are still the best way that you're not contacting them directly, that you have a roundabout route of contacting them, that it's so almost by post, um, et cetera, that is, you know, the letter given to somebody and comes to your residence or comes somewhere else. Um, I think email is a good way. Um, and this is not a, uh, you know, this is not a foolproof trick, but I have often left things in the draft folder and exited and someone else has come into the email, edited the draft folder and exited as well and we shut it after the story is over. This is nothing novel. It's not as if IP addresses cannot be found out, etc. if they are constantly scanning you or looking at you. Um, I think uh, technology means that we now have a way to map all our material well. So, you know, if you're mapping documents, make sure you have copies, you've not got everything online. Uh, you know, everyone knows about VPN. Everyone knows that, you know, if it comes to it, governments will ask internet technology providers to reveal uh, information, et cetera. So I think as journalists, uh, foremost to keep ourselves safe, I tell, I tell that to myself as well. Editors have told this to me, you're as good as your last story, uh, but that doesn't mean you make it your last story, right? So do everything possible to protect yourself. Uh, the second thing is lawsuits uh, and, you know, individual journalists getting involved in it. Um, I've, had a, I've had a couple, but I've had the support of my employers in it. I think the problem happens when employers themselves get involved in sort of slap suits, et cetera. And then sometimes the best they do, it's happened to me in a couple of cases, they pull down the story and they apologize, right? And then sort of your integrity as a journalist is thrown out in the open and said, you know, we are pulling out of that story and everyone puts you into a question mark. I think that's sort of the failure of an editorial leadership or the ownership, which I think is this is scopes out from this uh, particular conversation. Um, Julie, like a complete journalist, I have forgotten the second part of your question. That's fine. That's fine. I, I wanted to see if um, we had a, an audience member come in with a little question about also, you know, um, are journalists being trained in a manner today um, that enables them to report on these kinds of critical public interest stories? And, and uh, Anuba, you've, you've probably seen this generation come up and work with them. What do you think young reporters need to be aware of in terms of their skill set to do this kind of reporting? Um, you know, as, as Preeta said, I also do not regard myself as a business journalist and therefore I have learned to look at these documents and these disclosures that companies have. It's sort of, you know, why do I need to look at it, et cetera. And I think over my years uh, as a journalist, but also more specifically over the last two, two and a half years, when this sort of terminology of business and human rights and this framework has got so embedded in my work, I've realized it's a good skill set to have. Uh, it's not tough. It is not tough. Uh, there are very simple tricks of the trade that can tell you which particular page of an audit report you need to go and look at. Uh, you, uh, you can simply go on to uh, the website on environmental clearances and very, very quickly you can find out what the minutes of the meeting were, who were the people, how are they connected to ministers, etc. It is not tough. Um, I think it just needs a little bit of sort of rigor from uh, from our side as journalists and of course from sort of our editors uh, and the entire framework, you know, telling us that, you know, this is not just the scope of business journalists. This is not just the scope of academics or researchers. Everyone should try and have this skill set. It may or may not lead to a story. So I think that is one particular skill set. I think the second that I find if someone had told me uh, to, you know, uh, uh, to document well. I think my notebooks are great documents because I'm constantly on the ground and making notes. But I think, uh, you know, what these documents or what these disclosures are telling me, if I was to just be, what should I say, a little more disciplined, if I had been a little more disciplined about keeping these disclosures, I think over the period of six months, I would find a story idea there, which of course, I'd still need to go to the ground with, et cetera. So I think that's one skill set. Um, I mean, I think the rest have sort of already been 
discussed in a sense of uh, you know diversity inclusion but i think as we grow as journalists we often realize that we should see corporates and not ask them only about what they make you know put the corporate in the context of the geography in con- in the context of the policy of that particular sector because you know corporates you know the state is now today not the only actor corporates are doing a whole lot of more services providing services to citizens so they absolutely have a responsibility they're using natural resources they have a responsibility so i think often we tend to do uh, you know we ask them about their q3 results we ask them about new technology we ask them about how many women have you put on the board but we're not placing them in context of the geography and what else is happening Anuba, very, very practical tips. Um, and I took down there's a very quotable quote, we should not only ask business about what they make. Um, for me, a, a great way to end our panel. So thanks for putting a cap on that brilliantly. And a, a really warm thank you to all of you. We actually have more questions that have come in from the audience that we don't unfortunately have time to get to. So clearly this conversation has sparked interest. For those of you who continue to have interest in this topic, read the handbook and stay tuned to maybe some of the offers that UNDP is putting out to bring this issue of reporting on human rights to various countries, um, perhaps in your region. So I wanna give a very, very warm thank you to Anuba, to Prita, to Kritika for joining us. Um, your insights have been very, very welcome. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we are coming up on the event, uh, the end of our event. Uh, and so at this moment, I am really pleased to welcome um, Livio Sarandrea, who is a business and human rights advisor at the UN Development Program. Hey, Livio, it's nice to see you there. Thank you for joining us. Um, look, we, we've had an incredible conversation today about the value of equipping media professionals to report on stories where businesses fundamentally impact people's lives. Um, and UNDP has obviously been working for years and will continue to do so to um, support media professionals to do this kind of reporting. So tell us, where does it go from here? Uh, what do you think is gonna be the future of business reporting on business and human rights. Uh, what is the role that uh, quality journalism should be playing when it comes to talking about businesses impact on fundamental rights? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Julie, it's good to see you again. And uh, shall I say, uh, what a pleasure to be in company of so many journalists. Uh, I, I had to admit I have a soft, a soft spot for journalists, my father, was a journalist uh, and I, I remember when I was little and he would come back very late. Uh, actually, I wouldn't see him because he would always come back very late at night in those times when uh, newspapers are closed um, around midnight. So in fact, being a journalist was my first uh, dream uh, job. Uh, but then of course I developed, I, I, I became a human rights lawyer. So allow me also to thank the wonderful panelists, uh, the author of the manual, Nick, and, uh, and, and, and of course, Salil for his impressive uh, keynote remarks. Uh, and, and allow me, in fact, also to make a note and, and give a special thank to the government of Sweden that supports our project on business and human rights in Asia and made the drafting, the adoption of, of, of this, this uh, manual uh, possible. Uh, you, you ask a very good question on, uh, on the importance of reporting uh, currently in the future. And I, and I you know, perhaps picking up on some of the points already made, I'll say reporting on business and human rights is uh, critical and increasingly more so for two reasons. Uh, somehow illustrated already, but that I want to kind of summarize. The first is for accountability purposes. This was said over and over. It is critical to the discourse that uh, companies are under scrutiny from civil society and from, uh, um, from journalists as well for, for their practices. So accountability in the sense of that knowing and showing is if I had to use um, the terminology that Professor Raghi uh, the author of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights used for human rights due diligence. If human rights due diligence is about transparency, is about knowing and showing, I think your media has a lot to contribute in uh, 
even helping companies somehow in, in uh, uh, showing company will know what the risks are and, and media and other monitor actors help in the showing. So the transparency aspect of it. In this regard, uh, allow me perhaps for the sake of uh, uh, making a, today's discussion fully comprehensive uh, to point to a role that I think media can have not only to show bad practices. And let's be honest, we all know that unfortunately, most of the practices that are shown on the media and should be shown are of, of challenges, are of, of abuses. Uh, um, and, and we know that showing these cases encourages companies to, to be clean in their operation and their supply chain because they want to manage their, uh, their reputational risk. But I refuse to think uh, that there aren't also some companies that want to do good, that are doing good. And I, and I mean companies that really want to do that and are doing that, not those that of course uh, only uh, want uh, um, greenwashing. So I completely agree on going deep into the story, but when that going deep into the story also tell us a good story, I think that good story also needs to be told. Uh, I don't think that uh, Business and human rights reporting is exclusively about upsetting companies. It will naturally be mostly about that, but there, be, there may be good messages also that can be passed and that can motivate some companies in doing good. Because if the role of uh, one of the role, at least, of this reporting on business and human rights is uh, informing uh, consumers, consumers, of course, want to know when their products, the products that they buy, are linked. Uh, to abuses, but they probably also want to know where are those products that are not linked to abuses uh, and, and whether if, if I buy them, I'm actually probably contributing to the good people society. So it's a point I wanted to make just for the sake of, of having a comprehensive uh, discussion about the role of media vis-a-vis -vis reporting uh, corporate uh, practices. And I can see, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll add one more point, that, that uh, the interest in the future, you, you asked me about the future, the interest in these stories in the future is, is growing. I mean, I see it with my kids, they're seven, 10 and 15, and they're super interested in these issues around sustainability. They are interested on where the pro products uh, come from. So <clears throat> absolutely, the, the reference, uh, uh, that I want to make here is to the generation Zoomers, as we want to call it, uh, uh, those that will be the, the cons are already the consumers and will be the consumers in the future. And perhaps one very last point, uh, the generation Zoomers, and even us as adults, are using uh, um, not anymore the traditional media uh, to, to get our news, right? Uh, we get a lot of our news uh, through social media, right? And we know that social media is this big, melting pot of great journalists, very competent, but also people that are improvised uh, journalists or homemade bloggers and influencers. So let me just point then to that challenge there to, to somehow overcome, to make sure that reporting is done and is done in a, in, a, in a good manner. And that's all the sense of the manual that we put uh, out there. Uh, we want to make sure that those stories are reported in the right form. Again, I really hope our manual will be useful in that regard. I'll, Thank I'll you. Hear. Uh, Livia, that's that's tremendous. And and I think, you know, as you've been talking, we've had conversations going in the Zoom chat. So I think we, we can at least hope that we had some success today in sparking that conversation, in encouraging that exchange between, as you put it, um, really high quality journalists um, from countries around the world, um, having that conversation about how do we really tell this story properly. And as you describe, it's not always just a smear story, so to speak. It also could be a story about a positive change that has occurred, about learning from a mistake and improving. Um, but the, the task of journalism is to report um, what has occurred when it is in the public interest. Um, and uh, I think that every flourishing society must have free and fair journalism. And I think that this handbook can hopefully further that fundamental understanding of the role of quality journalism in our societies. So uh, I think the conversation is just beginning. For those of you who wanna be part of it, the first step is to check out the handbook. The link is in the Zoom chat. Be sure to grab that and maybe uh, UNDP can post it again. Um, and it will of course be available online.
And then the next step is to stay tuned to all of these various outreach opportunities that it looks like UNDP is uh, trying to put together to um, further uh, journalists' ability to cover these critical stories about businesses' impacts on workers and communities, which is a story that, as I said at the top, affects literally billions of people around the world. So with that, uh, we are done. It's been a tremendous 90 minutes with very impressive speakers. Um, and I'm so pleased that we can now say that that handbook um, is now officially launched. Um, please do go access it. And for all of those who registered, you will also automatically receive an email with a link to download that report. So with a very warm thank you to everybody and a thank you to the UN Development Program, Business and Human Rights. Um, I want to say good evening, good afternoon, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, the speakers, and all participants for this event. Before we close, can we request all to please turn on your cameras if you can for a final group picture. If you are a participant, you are able to turn your camera on now. And if you can, please do so, so that we can also capture you for the picture. I will give everyone about 30 seconds to do so, if that's okay. Taking a couple of pictures in the next five to 10 seconds. Just five more seconds. Great, thank you all once again.